Now, really, since the time of Jesus' ministry here on earth, uh, he has always had opposition, and there have always been all kinds of opinions about Jesus, about who he was. Now, this is something that was made again evident just in recent times. It seems like it seems like every Easter, there are you know, magazines, there are newspaper articles, there are TV shows that talk about discovering the real Jesus. You know, they kind of have historians or scholars talk about who they think that Jesus was. And let me just refer to a couple articles from one newspaper, the New York Times. I know it isn't kind of the conservative evangelical newspaper, but, but a couple opinions in two days that were given in two different articles in, in the New York Times. Uh, the first was a guy written by a guy, a guy named Eric Kopage. I think I'm saying that right. He started his article by saying that the frequent Western depiction of Jesus as being a fair-skinned man with blue eyes and dirty blonde hair was wrong, and which I agree with. Yeah, Jesus was not a light-skinned European. Um, you know, many artists in the Middle Ages drew him that way because, you know, out of their own prejudice and lack of understanding of the world. And, and no, that wasn't Jesus. But then he went on to say this. He said, but Jesus, born in Bethlehem, was most likely a Palestinian man with dark skin. And so he's saying that Jesus was Palestinian, not Jewish. He was Palestinian, you know, dark-skinned Palestinian. And this kind drew all kinds of, of you know, of opposition and, and complaints, and even not only from Christians, but from Jews, you know, that were saying that, denying that Jesus is even Jewish, so much so that the paper in a couple days had to issue an apology and a retraction. Now, now another article that was appeared the next day was, was, in a sense, less controversial because it was an opinion that was shared more by, by a number of people. It was an article that was a, an interview by, done by a man named Nis, Nis, Nicholas Krikstoff. Every year he does this at Easter. Uh, but it was an a interview with a woman named Cyrene Jones, who is a president of Union Theological Seminary in New York. And, and she you know, said a number of things. You know, the resurrection never happened. The idea of the resurrection you know, symbolize the ultimate love in our lives that cannot be crucified or killed. Speaking of the crucifixion, she said this. This is, quote, The crucifixion is not something that God is orchestrating from upstairs. The pervasive idea of an abusive God father who sends his own kid to the cross so God could forgive people is nuts. Speaking of God, she said this. God is beyond our knowing. He's not a being or an essence or an object. I don't worship an all-powerful, all-controlling, omnipotent, uh, omnis omniscient being. That's a fabrication of the Roman judicial, uh, judicial theory and Greek mythology. That's not the God of Easter. So totally, you know, <laughs> redefining who God is. God's, God's a spirit. He's a being, not a, not a person. About the resurrection and of Easter, he says, she said, for me, the message of Easter is that love is stronger than life or death. That's much more awesome than the claim that they put Jesus in a tomb and three days later he wasn't there. For Christians for whom the physical resurrection becomes a sort of obsession, that seems to me a pretty wobbly faith. And you look at this, and this is a president of a seminary, you know, teaching these things. You know, that's pretty scary. But you also realize that what you have is that you have, this reflects a lot of people's opinion, a lot of people's belief. And, and you see that, they're, you know, yet Easter comes out even amongst those who claim to be Christians, there's vastly different ideas about who Jesus was, why he came, and what his ministry was all about. And this isn't something that is new. You go back again to Jesus' ministry on, on, and what we see here in John. When we look in John 7, what we're seeing is that John 7, one of the key themes is that all this disagreement, in fact, it's all really throughout the whole book of John. Even our series title, you know, I Am, what is it? It's, it's Jesus throughout the gospel said, I am. He's taking the name of God. I am. And then he makes statements. I am the resurrection. I am the life. I am, I am the light. You know, I am, you know I'm, I'm the water. I'm the bread of life. And, and he makes all these statements. And in the midst of that, you have people disagreeing. You know, saying, no, no. Some people are saying, yes, he is the Messiah. Other people, no, he's a fraud. You know, no, he's only a miracle worker. No, he's, he's a teacher. Who is Jesus. And in John 7, we see that it's specifically drawn out here that there's all these conflicting views about who Jesus was and why he came. In fact, if, we, if we're going to see next week in verse 43, it sums up the chapter. It's saying, so there was division amongst the people over him. 
So if you go even back to the beginning of chapter 7, what we saw in the beginning is that his brothers were trying to recruit him to go to Jerusalem because they believed in him, in him as a miracle worker. And, uh, and again, many people still see that. They, they see Jesus as almost kind of a genie. And so religion is figuring out how to rub the lamp the right way, how to pray the right way, how to do the right things, how to somehow you know, rub God the right way so that he's going to do the things that we want. And that's a common view of God. Others see him as a good moral teacher. And again, that's, we see that was the case here in John chapter 7. It was then, it was today. We come to verse 35 where we start today and we read, and some of the people in Jerusalem therefore said, is not the man whom they're seeking to kill. So you have some of the religious leaders, they want to kill him. They look at him and they see Jesus as a threat. Now, whether they see him as a fraud or not, they, they clearly see him as a threat. And uh, the more that people were trying to, starting to follow Jesus and the more that people were kind of going to him, the more threatening he was. In verse 26, we see that, that the people you know, had these different opinions. It's not the man whom they're seeking to kill. And, and here he is speaking openly and they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities know that this is really the Christ? And you have some people saying, well, yeah, they're opposing him, but maybe they know something. You know, maybe they know he really is, when they say the Christ, it's another word for the Messiah. Maybe they know that he's the Messiah. Maybe they, they've studied the scriptures and they know something and they're threatened by that. Maybe they're not killing him because, you know, they don't want to cross him. They know that he's got power. Or look at verse 31. Yet many of the people believed in him, um, and they said, when the Christ appears, he will, will he do more signs than this man has done? And so they're looking at it, they're saying, well, the Old Testament, it, it teaches that the Messiah is going to be the healer of the nations, that he's going to be one that's going to do miracles, that's going to do these great healings. And, and they're looking at all these miracles, all these healings that Jesus is doing, and they're comparing it to the prophecies that they knew, and they're saying, okay, if, when the Messiah comes, this is the kind of stuff that he's going to do. Now, would the Messiah do more than what Jesus is doing? Because he's doing an awful lot. And so they're saying, well, maybe he is the Messiah. He is matching up with the Bible. So there's all these different opinions. Again, then, as of now, all these different opinions about who Jesus is. But here's what we've got to realize is that when Jesus responds to this, he challenges us to say, okay, how do you know if you have the right opinion? What you need to do is you need to go back and you need to evaluate the opinion not by the sincerity. It's not a question of how sincere you are in your belief. Because you can be sincere and sincerely wrong. You've got to go back and you've got to evaluate it by its source. Go back to the source. What is the source of your beliefs? So again, you have different people arguing different beliefs and different opinions about who Jesus was. And what's interesting is that Jesus didn't try to argue saying, okay, let me, let me argue, argue logic and show you why this is logically the case. Or, or he didn't try to say, well, let me do more miracles and convince you by what you see. Um, no, what he did is that he appealed to, you know, not their expectations, not, well, here's what you want. What he did is he appealed to the fact that he was from God. That my source is that I'm from God, I'm sent from God. You look at scripture and I'm fulfilling scripture. You see, unfortunately, the reality is that many people in our world today, as it is then, don't find their beliefs, don't find their convictions about who Jesus is, who about God is, from the Bible. Many people in Jesus' day, as our day, have very strongly held ideas, strong beliefs, but their beliefs are, are based more on their opinions, their own opinions, their own values, or even the opinions or values of the world uh, more than anything else. And so, so we, you know, we've got to say, what is it rooted in? Now, let me show you how this was the case in Jesus' day. Okay, we, we saw in a, in a moment ago that, you know, that there's, the people are debating who Jesus is, that he might be the Messiah, he might be the Christ. Now, look at verse 27, if you have your Bibles open. He says, for we know, that where, we know where this man comes from, and when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. Now, there was a popular view amongst many at that time that when the Messiah came, he would come out of nowhere. He'd appear suddenly, that, you know, that it would be like suddenly kind of dropping out of the sky. And what they're looking at is, well, we know this man, Jesus. You know, we know his parents. We know where he was raised. We know where he comes from. And, and so if the Messiah is going to come out of nowhere, well, Jesus, no, he didn't come out of nowhere. He came from somewhere. Now, let me ask you a question. Does anybody know where in the Bible 
the prophecy is that the Messiah would come out of nowhere. You know, the prophecy that he would suddenly appear out of nowhere. And, and uh, because they're saying, we know that this is the case. Kind of like, you know, everybody knows this. We, you know, we study the Bible and the Bible's telling us about the prophecy of Messiah, the Messiah. And, and we know that, that he's going to come from nowhere. Well, let me give you a hint. You know, you, know, you might look up the, the book of Hezekiah. Um, or if not there, you can try First Hesitations, chapter 3. You know, it's kind of like... You know, and just in case you don't know, there is no book of Hezekiah. There is no book of first hesitations. And the whole idea is, is that when you look at this, the Bible does give us passages that tell us where the Messiah would come from. There were prophecies. It said that he would be born in Bethlehem. It said that he would come out of Egypt. That there were scriptures that talked about the Messiah, what to look for. So how did they come up with this idea that the Messiah would come out of nowhere? And the answer is from the same place as many of the theological statements that people make about God today. The same place that the woman, the president of that seminary, got all her beliefs about God. It came from, it came from nowhere. It came from thin air. It came from their own imagination, their own opinions. You see, I hear people all the time say things like, you know, I believe that God would be this way, or that God would do this, or God wouldn't do this. And the vast majority of times, you know, we're, I'm talking to people who are really, really confident about their beliefs about God. But at the same time, what they're saying about God or what they're saying about Jesus in no way comes from the Bible. It's coming from their own opinions or, or the opinions and values of our culture today. You know, so that as the culture changes, well, what we know about Jesus has changed because, because he's going to be like what we expect him to be. Or at best, it comes from a very selective use of Scripture taken out of context that I can quote the Scripture that, you know, that's totally out in context. It may not be at all what the Scripture meant to say, but, but I can affirm that, well, because the Bible says this, I can affirm that Jesus is someone totally different than what the Bible itself really even says it is. So what happens is they reject the Jesus revealed in the Bible, not because Jesus doesn't match up to biblical prophecy, not because Jesus doesn't match up to what's revealed about God in the Bible, but because Jesus doesn't match up to their own opinions, their own expectations, their cultural values. And because I, I know that God's going to be like I expect him to be, therefore, since God doesn't match my expectations, because God doesn't match the reflection of my own heart, my own values, well, that isn't the God that I believe in. But here's what I want you to realize, is whenever we have a God that is an expression of, it's based in the source of our own opinions, our own values, what we have is not the true God who is. What we have and what we're worshiping is basically ourselves. We're worshiping our own opinions. We're elevating our own thoughts and our own, our own values. The only way to have a right view of who Jesus is the only way to have a right view and understanding of what Jesus came to do is to look at and to see that it's not rooted in our own opinions and our own values or the culture, but it's got to be rooted in the scripture. It's got to be rooted in divine revelation. Because what is scripture? You see, scripture is God revealing himself to us. It's God who is unknowable that is beyond us saying, okay, let me try to explain myself. Let me tell you things about myself. So he reveals it through his word. And therefore, whatever you believe about God, the fact is, is that, the, the, you know, that our, my beliefs, your beliefs, anybody's beliefs about God, about Jesus, about the truth, about you know, how we have a relationship with God are only true to the degree that they align with what God has revealed about himself. Look again what, John, what we're told here in John, John 7, verse 27. The people argued that their beliefs about the Messiah, you know, well, we know, but it was based on their opinions. We know that this man, you know, where this man comes from, but when the Christ appears, we know that no one will know where he comes from. Look at Jesus' response, verse 28. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, you know me, and you know where I come from, but I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true, and of him you do not know. I know him, and I've come from him, and he sent me. And he says, you know, you think you know me. You think you know I'd come from Nazareth. You think you know my parents, but you don't know my whole story. 
You don't know where I was born. You don't know that I, you know, my childhood in Egypt. You don't know that I perfectly fulfilled the prophecies of the Bible. But beyond that, you don't realize that ultimately that I come from God. You don't know the virgin birth. You don't know these things. No, I come from God. That I am revealing God to you. And what you're saying is you don't know me and therefore you don't know God. The fact is you cannot know God apart from knowing Jesus Christ. And there are people that will, you know, today that will talk about even, well, you know, these people are really sincere and and it's not Christianity and they don't believe in Jesus, but they sincerely believe God. No, what Jesus is saying is it is impossible to know God apart from knowing Jesus Christ. And if we don't know Jesus Christ, we cannot know God. And it's not a Christ of our own making, it's the Christ as he's revealed himself in the Bible. Look what happens, verse 28. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, you know me and you know where I come from. But I have not come from my own accord. He who sent me is true, and him you do not know. I know him, for I come from him, and he sent me. So he claims to be God. He claims to be the true Messiah. And look at the response of the religious leaders, verse 30. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. So he says, now I'm of God. And the response isn't to disagree with him. It isn't to look at scripture. It's just to say, I don't like what you're saying. And they, and they, and they reject it. They seek to arrest him. Look at verse 31. Now again, remember that the opinions about the Messiah coming from nowhere weren't based on the Bible. But some of the people remembered some of the prophecies. Yet, verse 31, many of the people believed in him and they said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? So some of them, again, they looked at this and we said, well, no, we know the Old Testament has prophecies that the Christ will heal the nations. And, and, and you know, they're looking at this and they're saying, he's fulfilling those prophecies. Again, if that's what the Bible says, you know, can the Messiah, is he going to do more than what this man is doing? Maybe he is the Messiah. Look at verse 32, the Pharisees, the religious leaders. The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him, and the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. This is amazing. You see, the people are starting, to, they're not only hearing the claims, but they're starting to match up. Some of them are matching up Jesus and his ministry with what was prophesied in the Bible. They are looking to the right source. And some of them are starting to come to the right conclusion. And the religious leader's response when they hear this is to send people to arrest Jesus. And I think the weight of what they're saying is, we have our expectations of what we know the Messiah is going to be. We know what he's going to look like. And even if God himself were to come down from heaven and tell us about the Messiah, if it doesn't meet our expectations, we're going to reject him. And although they are claiming that they are seeking God, in reality, they're not. They're seeking a God of their own making, a God that conforms to their expectations. And it's, again, what we do in our culture today. I'll talk to people, again, all the time who will tell me things, you know, you know, well, you know, my belief about God is this. The God I believe is this way or the God I believe wouldn't do this. You know what is amazing to me? Is that oftentimes that statement is in response to, some, you know, to me or somebody else saying something that is straight from the Bible. The Bible says this. It may be even a quote of Scripture. You know, the Bible says this in Scripture. Jesus said this. And this, well, the Jesus that I believe in wouldn't do that. You know, basically they're saying, it's an idea I don't like. And so even if Jesus himself comes and tells me this is true of me, well, that's not the Jesus. That's not the true Jesus because the true Jesus is the Jesus of my thinking, not the Jesus, not the Jesus that revealed himself. My friends, that's so dangerous. It's something that we see here. It's something that we, that we continue to do. But what we've got to realize is that the God that we believe is not the God who is. It's the God of our own making. We're worshiping our own ideas. And it's real easy to criticize that in other people, but we have to be careful that we don't do it in our own lives as well. What about those times that the Bible says something we don't like when God reveals something that con- confronts us, that offends us? We're going to say, well, I don't really choose to believe in that part. No, do we believe in the God who is, who's revealing himself? Or are we saying that God has to conform to us and our opinions and our expectations, our values? You see, Jesus roots his authority, his ministry, everything in his transcendence is the one that is from above. Now, I know some people will argue out back, and it's really common today. Well, that's your opinion. This is my opinion. That's what you believe about God. This is what I believe about God. You know, that's your truth. 
And again, what we have to realize is that when people say that, there is such thing as absolute truth. God is who he is. You know, there isn't like, you know, this is your truth about God, this is, no, there, whatever God says he is, that's who he is. And I can be, again, very sincere about my beliefs, but if they don't align with who God actually is, then I'm sincerely wrong. And so, again, when people would say, well, that's your opinion, that's my opinion, well, no, it's not my opinion. I really work very, very hard to say, I'm not, I'm not giving you my opinion, I'm giving you what God says. And again, there are numerous times that what God's word has said disagrees with my opinion. I don't like it. I struggle. And the question is, okay, am I going to, am I going to you know, die to my own opinion, my own values, and let God change me and conform my ideas and beliefs to what God reveals about himself, or am I going to stand on myself and say, no, God has to, re- has to conform to me? My friends, I'd do that. We all need to do that. See, our goal in this is, to know who God is, but not only in theory, not only in theology, but to recognize that the whole story of the Bible is not only God revealing himself, but it's revealing himself to us so that we can know him, so that we can have a relationship with him. And so there's a sense that God calls us to understand who he is, but in a sense, in relation to ourselves. See, you know, when we look at this, you know, this is the whole discussion, and Jesus kind of brings it home to this. At the end of this whole discussion of verse 37, we're told on the last day of the feast, the great day Jesus stood up and cried. You know, he's, you know, he said, basically, this is the point I want you to all get. This is what it's about. This is, this is the priority. This is, this is where, you know, the kind of the climax of this whole argument. Verse 37, if you follow along in your Bible, on the last day of the great feast, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, I said this about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were yet to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now, what he's talking about here is he's saying, okay, first of all, if, to understand God and our relationship with him, there's a degree we have to understand ourselves. We have to understand, in a sense, our thirst. And he's saying that, okay, you've got to understand yourself that you are, that all of us, we are created by God. We are not only created by God, but we're created for God, for relationship with God. That there's a sense that all of us are created with a, with a hole in our hearts. Some people describe it as this God-shaped back, vacuum, this, this thing that is at the core of our being. That if we have a relationship with God, that, that, you know, that kind of is the, the core piece of life that makes life work. But the problem is we were created for that, but when we sinned, our relationship with God was broken all well, the way back to the Garden of Eden. And so the whole of the gospel is God pursuing us to a relationship to be able to forgive our sins and to restore the relationship we were created for. But because of our sin, we have this thirst. He describes this, this soul thirst. And we understand physical thirst. We understand what it means but what he's saying is that, no, the soul has a thirst that is, that's like the physical thirst. When you go without water, your body gets thirsty, and in times it becomes unhealthy and it dies. We need it, and we've got this incredible thirst. And in the same way, if our soul goes without God, we get thirsty. When we don't have this relationship with God, there's, there's, this, there's this hole in our heart that cries out for meaning and significance and Just as our body was made to live on water and we need it, so our soul was made to live on a relationship with God. Now, this is the most important thing that we've got to realize about ourselves. If you understand who we are, who you are as a person, nothing else is more important than this. You have a soul and you were made to have a relationship with God. You were made to live on God. You need him. The the soul is, is something that needs him like your body needs water. In fact, while you have physical desires, we all have physical desires, there's a sense that those desires, they can satisfy us, they can give us pleasures for a moment, they can give us joy for a moment, but, but that can only satisfy the physical. The fact is we have a deeper, all of us have a deeper soul thirst that cannot be satisfied by anything that the world has to offer. It can only be satisfied by a relationship with God. Now, what's really amazing here is, I'm going to introduce this and I'm going to come back to it, is that Jesus appeals to our thirst. He says, all those who are thirsty, come to me and I will satisfy you. He appeals to us. 
He says the reason that we're to come to him is because we're thirsty, because we have this need, and we come to him because we want, we want our needs, we want our, we want our needs satisfied. We want to find fulfillment. We want to find life. And part of this is also understanding that in this thirst, the fact is in life, we're going to find all kinds of substitutes that we're going to try to quench that thirst. Things that, that will for a moment. See, part of this is understanding our brokenness. Yes, we were created for a relationship with God. Our soul was made for that. But in the midst of that, when we don't have that relationship, the world promises all kinds of other water, all kinds of other liquid, and say, man, if you go to this, this is going to satisfy you. And, and the fact is, it will for a moment. There are a lot of things that may even taste sweeter than water. They may taste good for a moment. It may make you feel like satisfied for a moment, but it's, it's almost like salt water. You know, you taste it and it tastes good, but next thing you know, the next, you know, before long, you're more thirsty than you were before. Jeremiah talks about this, and, and he describes this as broken cisterns. He says, these are sources of water that, that leak badly. Look at what he says. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and hewed out, hewn out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Saying, here's what happens. We're making two mistakes. Number one is that the thing that we're created for, the only thing that can satisfy that thirst, we're going away from that. We're not seeking this relationship with God. We're not finding him at our core. But then we're also looking for other things. We're finding these broken cisterns. We're finding things, sources that we think that are going to satisfy. And they seem to be filled for a moment, but they leak badly. And so we pour our whole life into this relationship, hoping we're going to find fulfillment, and, and it does for a moment, and it leaks badly. And so we pour it into our work, and we pour it into pleasure, and we pour it into and the broken cisterns. And the tragedy is that they keep us from finding the true water. We keep seeking after this, and I need more of this. I need, it doesn't satisfy, but, but it, it's quen it's quenches the thirst for a moment. We think we need more of this thing, and it keeps us from finding the true water. This is the whole message of, of Ecclesiastes, if you've, if you've never studied it. It's a great, great little book. And in the book of Ecclesiastes, you have Solomon in a time that he was a, a away from God, looking for meaning, looking for life, looking to quench this soul thirst. And here you have this most wealthy, powerful person in the world, and he can pursue anything he wants. And look at what he says. He says, vanity of vanity, all is vanity. Uh, Ecclesiastes 1, verse 2, and starting 2. What does a man gain by all the toil which he, which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but earth remains forever. The sun rises, the sun goes down, and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around the north, and around and around goes the wind, and the circuits of the wind returns. All the streams run to the sea, but the street, sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, they flow again. All things are full of we weariness, a man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear is filled with hearing. What has been seen, uh, what has been will be, what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. All is vanity. He says it's like chasing after the wind. You, you've sensed that there's something there, and you chase after it, and you grab it, and you just can't get it. Even in the description when he talks about you know, vanity, what is he saying? It, it, literally, some people have interpreted it saying it's pr probably a good way to interpret it. It's like a bubble. It's like a bubble that pops that you see it and you try to grab it. And in fact, let me try to illustrate this. You know, I, I can always twist Dave's arm. He's going to come and help me here. So I'm going to get you, okay? I'm going to, let's say if I can, can, can do a uh, reward, okay? I'm going to say, okay, this is, I'm going to give you a chance to walk away with something really great here today, okay? I'm gonna, if you can grab this bubble, if you can hold it for five seconds, yeah, I'm going to give you $50. There's a treasure, yeah, here we Okay, you know, it's, it's like, all you have to do is you just have to grab, you know, I've got these great, I'm giving you all kinds of bubbles. They're right there. Dave, you can see them. I mean, come on. It's like, you know, it's, it's, it's not like I'm hiding. Well, no, that one is, okay. You know, it's, 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 you know, it's all, they're right there to pot, you know, right there to grab. And it's like, you've got, you've got this great, you know, I can't even blow very well here. Here we go. I mean, it's, it's, man, you're just not very good at this. You're not very sincere, are you? No, thank you for helping. It's just, I was going to do, I actually was going to give a, a consolation prize of a box of peeps and I couldn't find them. You know, I just, I thought, I thought a box of peeps is like 
a great illustration of eating a sugar bubble. You know, it just is. But I'll bring some in next this week and give you some peeps. And, you know, and here's what he's saying is that, is that the world offers pleasure, but it's like a bubble that pops. And if you look at Ecclesiastes in chapter one, he talks about, I pursued wisdom, and I thought if I have more knowledge, and if I just get knowledge, but then he says, it's vanity, it's empty, and and all my knowledge just discourages me about what I don't know and what isn't working. And chapter two, it's he's pleasure and self-indulgent. Here's the most wealthy person in the world. You know, if you say, if you wanted anything, you know, if you talk about sex, he had, you know, 300 wives, 700 concubines, you know, he's, you know, that's a thousand women. You know, it's kind of like, you know, it's just, I mean, you know, you could, call up, you know, it's once every three years to get through the whole list. And he's got everything. And he says, vanity, vanity. He goes into work and he says, so I'm going to build monuments. I'm going to accomplish things. And my life will be about that. And he comes back and he says, so I hated life because what is un- done under the sun was grievous to me for all is vanity. It's driving after the wind. It's a bubble that pops. And here's what he's saying. Recognize the world makes promises. Yes, it does. The world will give you a bubble that you can grab for a moment and it seems sweet, it seems good. It's, it seems like, man, the treasure's right here. And you grab it and it's there for a moment and it pops. And, and so we want to go more. We come to think, well, but if I just go to the next bubble, if I just go to the next thing. And my friends, we see this not only in Ecclesiastes, but we see it through the lives of people that surround us and maybe some of the lives of some of you that are here today. That you have a deep thirst. And you're longing to fulfill that thirst. And you're trying everything that the world offers. And some people will teach a kind of health, wealth idea. Well, if you just go to God, go to the genie, he will give you those things. No, God isn't a means to the end. God is the end. All those things that we seek, yes, they will give pleasure for a moment, but it's like drinking salt water. It's like grabbing a bubble. And what does Jesus say? No, he is God's provision. Look at verse 37 again. On the last day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture is set out of his heart, living waters, rivers of living water will flow. And when he says that, it's, that he talks about our thirst, he's saying, I'm offering what is satisfying. And here's what you have to realize. Everything in the Bible is about this. Everything, all study, all theology, all preaching, all of this is designed to say, we want you to help discover this incredible banquet that God is offering to us. Everything that Jesus came to do, everything that he came to teach is is aimed at providing this soul-satisfying food and drink that satisfies forever. It was focused on that goal. We were created for that. And, and our soul is broken. And the whole Bible is God saying, I'm trying to re, you know, pursue you to try to restore this relationship so that your soul can be set free and restored to what you're created for. It has a thirst. And Jesus is, has come to satisfy that soul thirst. And it's amazing. Again, I want you to realize he's appealing to that thirst. He's saying, believe in me because I will satisfy. I will will give you life. I will give you the life that you long for, that you need. Only in me will you find that thirst quenched. And some people say, well, doesn't the Bible say that we should deny ourselves and, you know, just follow Christ? And well, yeah, it does. But here's what I want you to realize. When he calls us to deny ourselves, he's not calling us to deny our thirst. What he's doing is he's calling us to not deny a physical desire for the lies of the world, the physical things that we say, if I get this, if I pursue this, if I pursue pleasure, if I pursue wealth, if I pursue the things of the world, part of me longs for those because they look sweet. They taste good for a moment. And he says, no, deny that because it's going to ruin your appetite for what's true. Don't, don't, you know, what are the two lies in Jeremiah? You know, don't walk away from the true, true water and don't go to the broken cisterns. Deny yourself from the broken cistern because that drives you back to the true water. Sin is more than anything else. It's looking to other things other than Jesus Christ, believing their promises, believing that they're going to quench the thirst that only God can quench. And the wisdom of the world promises us all these things in the world that, oh, this will make you happy. These will, you know, if you satisfy this, disease, this desire, if you follow this need, if you, if you pursue after that, but none of them can satisfy those deepest desires of our soul. 
you know, even you look at things, and again, it's, you know, it's the bubble that pops. It's eating, you know, the peeps. It's, you know, it's a sugar-coated bubble. It's, you know, it's like eating Krispy Kreme donuts. They sound, taste great, you know, and they taste great for a moment. They melt in your mouth, and, you know, but you don't eat a whole meal of that. And if you do, you know, you're not satisfied, and next thing you know, you're sick. And, and yes, the world's promises satisfy for a moment, but it keeps us just from discovering the feast that the Father lays out for us. And Jesus says, no, I want you to be thirsty, and I want to satisfy that thirst. Whoever believes in me, out of his heart will flow living waters. It's not only that if you drink of me, it's when you have me, you'll find that I'm the stream that will satisfy all the thirsts. I'm the one that will bring meaning and significance and put into order every aspect of your life, you know, so that your work, your marriage, your finances, you know, your entertainment, all those things will make more sense. And the more you align with me, the more that you will find that, that I'm not only the stream, but I'm the stream that fills every other need in your life. Because you understand it in the context of, of, of what I created before. Now, that's the offer. But let's look at the nature of this offer that Jesus makes it's incredible because he says that he is the water who will quench our thirst. But I want you to see who he offers this to. You know, it's not just, okay, well, if you're religious, if you have the right beliefs, if you're raised in the right environment, if you've done the good events, if you've, it's not just that. But look at what he says. It's an offer of grace that he offers to all. Verse 30, look at verse 30. When they were seeking to, so they were seeking to rest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Yet many of the people believed in him, and they said, when the Christ appears, he will, will he do more signs than this man has done? So the response was that the leaders send people to arrest him. Now, people are there that oppose him, that are arrest him in that crowd. They're there to arrest him. And look at, in that context, he says in verse 37, on the last day of the feast, the great feast, Jesus stood up and cried, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. It's an invitation that he offers to all, an invitation of grace. I want you to see this is amazing that he looks at that crowd and knows that there are people that are opposed to him. He looks at that crowd and he knows that there are people that are there to arrest him. And he says, anyone who can hear the sound of my voice, if you thirst and if you come to me, I will give you drink. I will satisfy your soul. Anyone. That's amazing that he speaks these, this to his adversaries. It's the whole spirit that you see. I think, you know, it's, it's, you know, the Roman soldier. Why did the Roman soldier at the end? This is the Christ. Because it's the same spirit that he saw here. That here you have these people that had tortured Jesus, that had persecuted him, had mocked him. That Jesus cries out and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they look at that and they say, this is somebody different. And here you have Jesus looking and saying, the people that are coming to arrest him, that are opposing him and saying, I offer you grace. If you come to me, if you're thirsty, there's an incredible power here. And what it means that he's saying it to you. And you may be here and saying, no, you know, you don't know, I've, I'm, I've not, you know, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've, you know, I've, I've ignored God. I've rejected him. I've, and you, there may be some people here that you just feel like, no, I don't belong. This isn't to me. He can't offer this to me. And I want you to realize that he looks at the people that were there opposing him, coming to arrest him, had their intent to kill him. And he says, if you're thirsty, if you come to me, I will, give you, I will satisfy your soul. My friends, you understand that this offer to grace is to every one of us here today. No matter where you're at, no matter how far away you are, if you're a believer and you've wandered away from him and you know, and it's like, man, he's got to be mad at me and he's got to... No, he offers you grace. If you're at the edge of wandering away, no, he offers you grace. He knows where you're at, and he says to you, if you, anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. What is the requirement? It isn't that you have to be good. It isn't, the requirement is you have to thirst. If you, anyone thirsts, let him come to me. What is a thirsty person? The person is a person that doesn't have anything. The, person is the, the thirsty person is the person that is willing to admit the absence that, that my life isn't the way it's supposed to work. It's crying out. And the people that get excluded are the people that won't admit their need. The people that, that he's saying, well, you know, you know, you have no place in me are the people that say, no, I've got it. I've got my life on my own. I've got it all figured out. I'm doing it my way. See, the key is that we have to admit our need. And, and some of that is admitting the fertility of our previous efforts. Some of it has come and saying, no, I've been trying to satisfy them, and I've satisfied it here, and, and God, I agree with you, they haven't worked. And so I come to you as one that has tried to satisfy my thirst with all that the world has to offer, and, 
And it's left me, it's left me thirsty. So I admit my need. And so we come to him. And, and how do we then come to him? Again, look what does it says. Say, if anyone is thirst, let him come to me and drink. How do we come to him and drink? Verse 38. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow living, rivers of living water. How do we come to him? It says, by believing in him. We drink of Jesus as our water by believing. And here's what I think it's saying. What does it mean to believe in him? It means that we believe in who he is. We believe that he is the source. We believe in his promises. It's the same idea that Jesus said we saw in John chapter 6. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. It's coming to him and believing that he is the only one that can satisfy our deepest hunger and thirst of our soul. It's coming to him for the satisfaction of our soul. It's, it's, it's coming to him and saying, I know I need you. God, I know I was created for a relationship with you and there's something missing in my soul. And again, some of us have done that before and we've gone away from him and we're chasing after the things of the world and or we maybe come to Christ church on Sunday, but we don't think about God the rest of the week. And he said, no, I want to satisfy. Do you believe? Don't, it's not just intellectual belief. It's not just that you affirm the right ideas. If you look at your life, what do you pursue? What's most important to you? What do you trust in? What do you think is going to, what are you, what are you looking to, to satisfy that soul? That soul thirst. You see, and if it's anything other than Jesus Christ, if, if what you think about and what you pursue, the thing is your theology might be right about Jesus, but your belief really isn't there. Because your actions show your belief. It shows what you really believe in, what you value. And there may be some that say, well, I, I know that, but I don't know how to believe it. And, it. and it's come by admitting, God, I agree with you, I'm wrong. God, forgive me, I want you to, I want you to give me that desire. God, I give you the right to take away the desire to chase after all the promises of the world. And God, forgive me and, and give me the desire for you. Change my heart. And he does. And the amazing thing is, is that there's this incredible, you know, it's a process. It's not this one-time thing. It's just, I start by surrendering. And it's this process that he starts to change my heart. He starts to take my taste away from these things of the broken cisterns, the bubbles that pop. And and he starts to give me more and more of a desire to pursue the things that will, the only things that will satisfy. My friends, do you have that relationship with Jesus Christ? He invites you to do so today. He invites all who would thirst, not based on the righteous and the good and what we've done, or all who would thirst, who would admit that need. There are some that have that in the past, but again, if you look in your own life, you say, well, I have that, I believe that. And I'm going to challenge you to, how does your how does the actions, what do your actions show about what you really trust and what you really believe? And there are some who have a relationship with Christ that we, the fact is, is that practically we're really not trusting in him much. Over time, we've walked away from the living water and we're chasing the bubbles. We're, we're going after the broken cisterns. Are you willing to admit that? Are you willing to say, God, I, I, I ask you to change my desires. God, I, I, want to, I want to recognize that I'm thirsty and I want to find my satisfaction in you and you alone because only you can satisfy. He invites all of us to that today. I'm going to close in prayer in a moment and I do want to mention, you know, uh, I'll be in, in the uh, lobby and greeting people, but we have a couple people that will be up, up here afterwards and would love to talk with you and pray with you. Uh, if God's speaking to you, uh, whether you've trusted in Christ in the past, whether you never have, God's speaking to you. Please come up. Please talk to these men. Let them pray with you. Um, if God's speaking to you. Let him finish what he's begun, even this morning. Thanks for joining us. If you have any questions about what we talked about, Jesus Christ, our church, or anything else, connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or by email. We'd love to hear from you.